Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Please do not fall asleep. Um, I have something that is certainly of interest to me, and I hope it's of interest to you. Um, firstly, I want to say this is a very special day for me. Um, I've always held the Royal College in very high esteem, and now to be a fellow of the Royal College um, is a very proud day for me, so thank you. And if you read my application, you would have seen that um, what, I, what I've done for my career thus far is to figure out ways to measure pain, to measure pain in animals. Um, and I think that as a profession, we've come a long way in that, um, maybe as a result of my work, um, but certainly lots of other work across the globe. We're now pretty good at measuring pain. Um, and I've had a great, uh, a great run at that. I had a fantastic start under the mentorship of Avril Waterman Pearson and the late Alex Livingston with my PhD. I've worked with some great colleagues and friends such as John Innes over the years. Um, and together we've, we've developed methods to measure pain. So if ever there was a day to kind of sit back and, and look at those accomplish, accomplishments and feel good, it would be today. But what I really want to do is to move new therapies into clinical practice. Um, I want to create new therapies, new drugs uh, that make a difference to clinical practice, particularly in the realm of chronic pain control. And that's not happening. We're not getting those new therapies. If you think about it, there have been no novel analgesics for chronic pain in veterinary medicine in 25 years. There have been different non-steroidals and variations, but no new uh, modes of action, no new drugs with, with uh, different modes of action. So you have to say, well, why is that happening? And I think one of the reasons that's not happening is because we're not getting the candidates, the putative analgesics, to test. So the next question is, well, why aren't we getting them? Where do they come from? Well, they come from uh, human translational pain research. Um, human only because it's the process to produce new analgesics for human medicine. And I think to understand um, why we're not getting those new candidates, you have to understand a little bit about translational pain research and what it is. Um, it essentially starts off with discovery, where uh, very often you take uh, maybe leads and ideas, but very often you create a model of pain. You induce a pain condition in a rodent and look to see what is altered. That leads you to a pathway or a, or a receptor, some sort of target, and you then develop a therapeutic to hit that target, to shore it up, to, to downregulate it. Um, and once you've then got your putative therapeutic, your putative analgesic, you test that uh, back in the, actually the same types of rodent models that you develop the target in. Um, that should be a red flag. Um, and then from there, there are various steps um, that lead up to human clinical trials, um, including testing of efficacy in rodents, which is done in a very simplistic way, simply by uh, poking them, prodding them, and seeing when they react. Now, I used to think that translational pain research was a stepwise logical process through into human clinical trials. And in some respects, it is. Except at one point, there is not a step, but there's a huge leap. A leap from rodent work to human clinical trials. And I think that's one of the fundamental reasons why we have, are not producing new analgesics. I mentioned in veterinary medicine, we haven't had new therapeutics for chronic pain in 25 years. The same is true for musculoskeletal pain in humans. There have been no novel analgesics. There have been new analgesics, a mixture of a non steroidal and an opioid, um, uh, combination drugs, but uh, drugs that have already been known. So the human uh, translational pain research mechanism is failing. And so this is where I think we can start to see where pets can fit in. Um, pets suffer chronically painful conditions or chronic conditions that are associated with pain. And in many respects, those conditions reflect the genetic, the environmental, and the temporal characteristics present in human pain conditions. And so in many respects, I think they are better models of the human pain conditions. And I started off a few minutes ago by saying we can measure 
pain in animals. So if we can measure pain, we can use those models, pets with naturally occurring disease, to test putative analgesics and to optimize that translational process. Not only can we measure it, but we can measure pain in a way that's meaningful to humans. We can measure the dimensions that are impacted by pain in people, cognitive function, anxiety, fear, ability to perform the activities of daily living. Um, we can measure those things, and so the measurements are more relevant to humans than some of those reflexive measures in rodents. And this, this approach does work. A um, uh, beautiful statement this morning I heard from, from Dr. Glenn, if only they'd used the rabbits. Well, I would say, if only they'd used the dogs with natural occurring osteoarthritis um, to test some of these analgesics. The trip v one antagonists work in rodents, failed in humans. They failed in dogs. The NK1 antagonists worked in rodents, failed in humans, failed in dogs. Anti-NGF monoclonal antibodies worked in rodents, worked in humans, work in dogs. And we're building up that sort of pattern um, that uh, dogs and cats, uh, companion animals, are predictive. But I want to also, I want to end by going back to the beginning, um, the beginning of the whole process when you select your target. Any therapeutic development program, any drug development program will fail if the biological rationale is not sound. Remember how those targets are selected. You induce a model, you see what's altered, and then you create a drug against what's altered. Um, for example, uh, if you want to uh, develop a therapeutic for neuropathic pain in people, you take a rodent, a rat, you tie a suture uh, kind of somewhat loosely around part of its sciatic nerve, you see what's altered, you develop a drug target to that, move into human clinical trials. Um, not many humans suffer from partial ligation of their sciatic nerve, which makes me wonder about the relevance of that model, therefore that target, to the human condition. Um, and so I think, you know, we're, we're in a very fortunate position in veterinary medicine. We have unprecedented access to tissues. We can measure pain, which means we can phenotype animals. We have access to tissues. We can then take those tissues and perform discovery. We can answer the question, what is actually altered? What is actually driving that pain state? Then we can take that target back into the rodent models, figure out the mechanisms, the best way to interact with it. But we have a target that I believe is going to be more relevant. So in summary, I would say that uh, companion animals, pets, can assist in translational pain research by being a verification bridge interposed between rodent work and human clinical trials, optimizing the process, um, saving failed clinical trials that cost hundreds of millions of pounds. And we can help inform what the appropriate targets are um, through interrogation, unbiased interrogation of tissues from well phenotyped patients. And so I think I'd end up by saying, um, if you believe in the concept of one pain, that pain is similar, the experience of pain, what is driving pain is similar across the species, then put very simply, there has to be some way to use the information we have in veterinary medicine from the multitude of species to inform human translational pain research. Why would we do that? We do it because we will benefit. Humans will benefit, but veterinary medicine will benefit from the extra information that we will learn and also from resources being directed at veterinary species, the species that we're interested in. Thank you.